And welcome back. Robert Breaker here. We are continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of Acts. And we've gone all the way up now to chapter 12. So we'll start chapter 12 today. Uh, I've gotten several emails from people that are saying, Brother Breaker, I'm all caught up. <laughs> when are you going to put out a new one? And I said, well, you got to wait. Every week I put out a new one. And there's people that say, well, I want it all now. Well, I wish I could do the entire book of Acts like that and have it all done. But we're doing this uh, verse by verse study every week. We have already done the uh, 14 epistles of Paul. So if you haven't seen those, please do that verse by verse Bible study. And then hopefully by that time, when you get through those, then we'll have finished the book of Acts. But every week I'm doing a new uh, video on the book of Acts as we continue our verse by verse Bible study. <clears throat> so today we're going to start chapter 12 of the book of Acts. This chapter, chapter 12, introduces a new character. We have a guy here named Herod. Herod is a political figure. So we're going to see a little bit of a change here from religion and, and speaking about the religion and religious people that the early apostles are trying to deal with and win to the Lord and, and talk to and, and unfortunately are rejecting the message of God. We're going to come now to a man who is a secular person. So the Bible goes from religion and history to politics. So today we're going to talk about secular politics. Now we've already seen the religious politics, how religious leaders tried to stop the preaching and teaching of the early apostles. And what did they do? Well, they tried to kill them and they tried to shut them up by putting them in jail. And they called a council together and told them in the council, no, you can't speak in the name of Jesus. Don't talk about him anymore. And you know, what did the early apostles do? They said, phooey on you. God told us to do it, so we're going to do what God said. And it didn't work. It did not work the religious politics as the religious leaders tried to stop the preaching and teaching of the apostles. So now we see the devil, because he hates the message of God, going to the secular authorities and trying to get the secular world, the secular government involved, to stop this movement of God, of the early apostles going out and preaching and teaching. And again, it doesn't work. If anything, God shows who's in charge, and it's Him, God. And they do some of the same exact things that the religious leaders did. Same way do they try to stop it, by putting them in prison. In verse 4 and 5, why we find Peter in prison. Now, Acts chapter 12 is mostly about Peter. Almost the entire chapter is Peter, except for the very last verse, which mentions Saul. So as we're going through the book of um, Acts, I've shown you that we see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew through John, is all until Jesus dies, and then a little bit of those books do talk about after he rises from the dead. But Matthew through John are all back here. Then Jesus dies, and Jesus sends out Peter and the other apostles. And we started out the book, we see Peter and we see John. Now, as we continue this book, we see a lot of Peter. And then around about chapter 7, up shows Stephen. So Stephen is showing up in chapter 7. But we also see Saul, who is also Paul. And Paul shows up in chapter 7 as well. As a matter of fact, we find Paul in 758. Then we saw, find chapter 8 is about a guy named Philip. And so this guy Philip is mentioned. But Paul is mentioned in chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 9 is the conversion of Saul or Paul. So that's all his conversion. Now, chapters 10 and 11 are all about Peter again and how Peter goes and he wins some Gentiles to the Lord. But, guess what? Saul is mentioned in chapter 11. And Saul shows up in 11, 25, and verse 30. Then, chapter 12 is all about Peter, so I'll just put 12 there also. But he has to mention him in 12.25. So notice how Paul is not being left out. The writer of Acts wanted you to know from as, as soon as possible that there's this guy named Paul, and a lot of the book is going to be about him, 
So I'm going to keep inserting him in. Even when I talk about chapters about other people, I'm going to remind you now Saul was doing this at that time. And then Saul, which is Paul, was doing this. And then Paul was doing this. And so while Peter was doing this, Paul was doing... So I want you to get this. Paul is in the book of Acts more than Peter. As we continue, we'll see. Once we get to chapter 15, actually chapter 13, all of chapter 13 is about Paul. All of chapter 13. Um, chapter 15, Peter is mentioned, but it's more about Paul. And then from then on, 16, 17, 18, all the way out to chapter 28, it's all the ministry of Paul, because Paul is the central figure of the book of Acts, because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. He is the guy that God calls to replace Peter and the early apostles. And he is the one that God says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to reveal to Paul certain mysteries, and these are the mysteries that are going to be for the church, and the church is going to be mostly made up of Gentiles. So chapters 10 and 11 are, are about the first Gentiles getting saved. And that's wonderful. And Peter was the one that led them to the Lord. We looked at that last time. And how were they saved? They were saved by faith, by believing. Go back to Acts chapter uh, 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 43 and verse 44. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So we have salvation by faith. This is Gentiles getting saved. So the Gentiles get saved first here in chapter 10. And by the way, 10 is the number of the Gentiles, which is wonderful. So Gentiles get saved in chapter 10. That's the first time. First time Gentiles are saved. Now, with that said, as you continue reading this, you, you, you look at this and you go, now, what, what's going on? Because after the Gentiles get saved in chapter 10, and then Peter tells all about it over again in chapter 11, Peter doesn't go out and continue preaching to them. Rather, Peter goes back to the Jews only. In chapter 12, is Peter with the Jews suffering persecution in uh, and around Jerusalem. And what he's doing is, he's just like, oh, well that's great, Gentiles got saved. Okay, now back to my people. So even though God showed them, hey, Gentiles can get saved, they don't go out of their way to try to get them saved after that. They just look at that like, oh, well, that's interesting. And so it's not until chapter 15 that we get more into the Gentiles getting saved and what they're supposed to do. And now what does God tell a Gentile he should be like during this time period? And so we'll see more about the Gentiles. But I want you to see that Peter, and we've looked at this in the book of Galatians, Paul said he had to literally withstand him to the face. Paul had to go to Peter and say, you're wrong because you're not preaching to the Gentiles and you're not fellowshipping with them like you should. They can get saved too. Don't just concern yourself and care only about your own people and your own race. Everyone gets saved now, so treat all men alike. So Peter was, was uh, rebuked, basically, by Paul. And so we see here, as we continue, Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11, clearly Peter... Winning Gentiles to the Lord, but now Peter goes back to his own people and just kind of forgets about the Gentiles. And so as we get here, we begin here reading about a man named Herod, a Gentile, a, a leader of the, the country at the time. The Romans had taken over all of the land of what they call today Palestine, which is really the land of Israel. And they had taken over this land, and so now these secular authorities at the time were Rome, and the man in charge was a man named Herod. Now, uh, we, will we will start there here in one second, but before we do, I want you to remember Paul. You say, why are you starting this out talking about Paul when the whole chapter you're about to study doesn't mention Paul? <laughs> well, because of this. Yeah, it, it does mention him in, in, chapter, in verse 25. Why am I doing this? Okay, because after we read this chapter, chapter 12, then we go to 13. Chapter 13 is Paul sent out as a missionary going to uh, people to preach. And he goes only to Jews. Acts 14 is Paul going to more Gentiles. Acts 15, the question of Gentiles shows up again. And we see in Acts chapter 15 all of the Jewish believers getting together and, and asking about this question of well, what do we do with Gentiles that get saved? And what do we do with this guy named Paul? Because Paul is preaching something different than what has been preached up until this point. 
Now you've got to remember, what was it that Peter preached first? The first thing that Peter preached right in the early book of Acts was Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized in water for the remission of sins. So the water was being preached here at the beginning. Get baptized in water. Why was that being preached? Because it was for the Jews. So the Jews were being baptized in water. Now, these Gentiles got saved and they got baptized in water too. But the water was after they received the Holy Spirit. You see, they had to be baptized in water here to get the Holy Spirit. Now you get the Holy Spirit by believing or by faith. Okay, so I want you to get a hold of that. It's by faith alone that we're saved. i got a bad marker there. And as we continue this book of Acts, this is so important that you get a hold of this. God begins to reveal some things to Paul. And Paul begins to preach a little bit more than what has been preached and begins to add to the message and you go to this and you go wow I'm starting to see it I'm starting to see Paul's gospel why God chose Paul what did Paul preach that was a little bit different let's go to Acts chapter 13 Acts chapter 13 which will be our study next time Lord willing if we get through this chapter Acts chapter 13 look at what Paul preaches in verse 38 and 39 Paul preaches, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So Paul's message, what Paul begins to preach, is justified, or justif justification by faith. Faith in what? Well, we know what Paul preached a lot in his ministry, faith in the blood. So it's the blood atonement of Christ that saves us. And Paul is very adamant when he's teaching in saying, not the law. So it's not the law that saves us. So when we get to chapter 15, that's the question. Chapter 15 of the book of Acts, the question is arising and the question comes up is, what is the place of the law for salvation? Are we saved by keeping the law? Are we justified by the works of the law? And the answer is, no. No. So the question arises in Acts 15. Well, let's look there quickly. Acts 15, verse 1 and 2. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So you can't be saved unless you keep the law. Because circumcision is saying, this is a token that I'm getting under the law. Verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So the question is, are we saved by the law? Acts 13, 38 and 39, Paul says, not the law. You're justified by grace through faith without the deeds of the law, without the works of the law. So the question arose, are the Jews under the law? Are Gentiles who have believed in Jesus now under the law? The answer is a resounding no. No, we're no longer under the law. Now remember also what we've been looking at, the who versus what. Remember the early book of Acts, when they go around preaching, they're preaching who Jesus is. But what Paul brings is a message of what. And Paul's message is believing in what Jesus did for you. So no longer is it just, hey, believe who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah. You've got to trust in what Jesus did to be saved. So you've got all that coming together. And so we're starting to get into the really good parts of the book of Acts. Remember the book of Acts is, and I'm going to say it again like I try to remember to say every teaching, Acts is a transitional book. We're seeing a change from Jews to Gentiles, from Israel to the church, from Peter to Paul, from water baptism to be saved by getting the Holy Spirit through baptism and water to getting the Holy Spirit by faith and being sealed with the Holy Spirit by trusting in the blood atonement of Christ. From trusting in who Jesus is to trusting in what Jesus did for you. So the book of Acts is a transition book, and we're seeing that transition. Now we'll get into that a little bit later and really focus in on Acts 13, the new message that Paul is preaching. Now, verse 1, Acts chapter 12. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now Herod was, and boy, I hate to get into the Herods. There's so many Herods. <laughs> There's so many people named Herod that it's confusing. But uh, this guy is found in Acts chapter 4. He's mentioned before, Acts 4.27. Look what it says here in Acts 4.27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. So Herod was the one that, that Jesus stood before. Jesus stood before Herod and Pontius Pilate. 
So this would be that same Herod, I believe. He's a leader in Jerusalem. He would be a king over that region, appointed by Rome. And so this is taking place in Jerusalem. Now it says the church. The church. Now, if you're a hyper-dispensationalist, you don't believe the church starts until way out here with Paul. And many hyper-dispensationalists that I've met say there's no Jews in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. The church is the body of Christ. Well, right here in Acts chapter 12, when it says the church, it is only speaking of people who are Jews who have been saved by trusting in who Jesus is. So the church must have Jews in it. Because what we're going to read here, not a single Gentile is anywhere near here at all. If you remember, I think it was in Joppa that he went to Cornelius. And Cornelius, the Gentile, got saved. Then he comes back to Jerusalem. There's no Gentiles that are saved in the church in what we're reading here in chapter 12. So remember, the church is made up of Jew and Gentile. Anybody that's gotten the Holy Spirit after Jesus dies is a part of the church, which is called the body of Christ. And God reveals later to Paul what the body of Christ is and how it's made up of both Jew and Gentiles. So Herod wanted to stretch forth his hands to, to do bad things to those that claim to be Christians. Why? Because they were stirring up the Jews. They were telling the Jews, no, your religion is false. You need Jesus. You can't get back under the law. It's not the law that saves anymore. It's Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who came and fulfilled the law. Now trust in your Messiah. Now, verse 2 says, And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. James, now you remember John, Peter, James, and John. Peter, John, and then this guy, James, were almost always together, as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When Jesus is praying, Peter, James, and John are there. Well, Herod comes along, and Herod kills James. So Herod kills this guy. And Herod kills James. And he doesn't kill James, the brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus had a half-brother named James. And we'll see him in Acts chapter 15. He kills one of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. It's that James, the, the brother of John. I believe that would be, weren't their last names Zebedee? I believe he was Zebedee. And so um, that would be his, his uh, surname, if you will. So he kills this guy named James. So he was definitely one of the, the chief apostles. And he wrote the book of James. Now the book of James, if you read the book of James, it is heavily, I mean heavily, to Jews about the tribulation. I personally believe that the entire book of James applies to the tribulation more than anything else. A lot of people say, well, the book of James is written for the church today. That's hard to believe. That's very hard to gather. Let's go to the book of James really quickly, and let me show you how it starts out. I get this question probably more than any other question of all the questions that I receive via email or phone calls and everything else. People say, Brother Breaker, I don't understand the book of James. It makes no sense to me. It says in James, you know, that you can be saved by works, and, and I don't know what to do with James. And I say, do one thing for me. Just do me one favor. Read the very first verse of the book of James, and then tell me if you're one of them. <laughs> and they usually go, oh, thank you, Brother Breaker. Now I completely understand. Look at what the book of James says. It, just, it says, James, a servant of God, this is verse 1, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So the book of James wrote an epistle to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. And he writes to them about Jesus, their Messiah. But if you read the book of James... He's, he's writing to them, and, and what he's writing sounds like he's trying to prepare them for the tribulation period. Because he knows that they've rejected their Messiah, and that God's done with the nation of Israel, now he's starting to deal with Jews, so now the Jews as a whole need to realize we've rejected our Messiah. And so much of the book of James applies to the tribulation. There's so much in the book of James, I don't have time to go there, but there's some places in the book of James where he starts to talk about Elijah and how he made it not rain for three and a half years. Well, Elijah would be one of the two witnesses that shows up for, you know, three and a half years. So what do we got here? We got the book of James. Many people today think the book of James applies to the church today. Well, it must have been written back here if in chapter 13 James dies. So James dies in chapter 13. So I'll, I'll write James right here, and I'll put 13, and then I'll put a little X in him because he was killed. So all the doctrine that James knew 
was what happened before from here to here. And he probably wrote that letter way before that, if he was killed here. So let's say he wrote it way back over here in the time of Stephen. That would still have been in the thinking of the tribulation still coming and the kingdom could still be back here. So once you get a hold of that and you look at the book of James and you say, oh, the book of James doctrinally applies more to the tribulation. It's not something that we can literally apply to the church today. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Because as you read the book of Acts and you understand the book of Acts, you understand that all of this is Paul and you get most of the doctrine for the church today here. Because this is all changing. This is all transitional. This is changing slowly from Jews to Gentiles. So when you rightly divide the word of truth, rightly divide the Bible, the word of truth, man, what a blessing to help you understand. So Acts chapter 2, and 12, and verse 2, And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. So they used a sword. What did they do? Well, they probably beheaded him. Cut his head off. Which is interesting because... What do they do to people that don't take the mark of the beast in the tribulation? They behead them, it says in the book of Revelation. I think that's interesting. Now verse 3, And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Why? Well, because those that were the closest to Jesus were Peter, James, and John. So we saw John in the early book of Acts with Peter everywhere he went. I don't know why he wasn't going with Peter anymore, but Peter, James, and John were the major hit list for the Jews to try to shut up the teaching of Jesus Christ. And so Herod caught James, beheaded him, and then tried to get Peter. And then it says, And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now verse 4 says, And when they had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions, of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So four quaternions. Some people say a quaternion was four soldiers. If that's the case, then there would have been 16 soldiers there guarding uh, Peter. Now, why did they want to arrest Peter? For a crime that he had committed? No. Peter committed no crime. But it was to please the people. Again, verse 3, because he saw it pleased the Jews. You see, the Jews were happy when the apostles died because they didn't want to hear about Jesus. So what you have is you have this nation, Rome, that's, that's the secular government, ruling. And what were they doing? They weren't ruling. It was mob rule. It was not a republic where laws govern. Peter, just like Jesus, was put in jail and he was innocent. Peter was not put in jail for any crime. He was put in jail because the people demanded, shut him up, put him in jail. But yet he did no sin. He was an innocent man going to jail. They did the same thing to Jesus. Why did they kill Jesus? Why did they put Jesus in, in jail? Not for some crime that he did, but to please the people. The people said, crucify him. So the secular government had a long history of persecuting and, and um, killing people who were innocent. So here the secular government is putting people, arresting people and putting them in jail when they weren't even criminals. They did it to Jesus, then they tried to do it to Peter. Innocent men going to jail. And all throughout history you've seen that. When evil people get in power, they will take people that are innocent and put them in jail. And we see that all the time. Now, jails are full of people that are guilty too. <laughs> but what I hate and what is sad to me God says he hates those that pervert judgment. Is to see someone who's innocent that hasn't done anything wrong, but they're persecuted, whether it be for their faith or for something else, and they're put in jail, and they're persecuted, and they're whipped, and they're mocked, and even killed when they've done nothing wrong. That is the saddest thing. And yet, that's what Jesus went through. He was the innocent suffering for us, the guilty. Now, when did this take place? Verse 3. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So verse 3 tells us that this is the days of unleavened bread. Now my Bible note says here that this is probably taking place around 44 A.D. So what we're reading here in chapter 12, where we are today, is taking place around 44 A.D. Alright, Jesus dies in 33 A.D. Now people say, well there is no zero, so there's no zero, so it's really 34 A.D. or something like that. They, they say the calendar's a year off or something like that. So 10 to 11 years after the death of Christ. Now Stephen was about a year later. So about 
nine to ten years after Stephen. So nine to year, ten years had passed. And so we're in about 44 A.D. Now, here's something interesting. If you look at Paul, the Bible tells us feasts. And we can count, knowing that the Jews have a feast every year, we can count the dates in the Bible. And it's amazing. Um, Paul says in Galatians 1.17 that he spent three years in Arabia. He says in Galatians 2.1 that 14 years later, he sees the apostles in Jerusalem. Well, Paul is saved in 34 A.D. So Paul is saved in 34 A.D. Let me put this up here. Paul saved in 34 A.D., about a year after. All right, you add three years in Arabia, three, three to that. Then you add the 14 years that he said, and you add that up. That's what, 41 A.D.? 51. Let's make sure I got that right. Yeah, 51. See, I hate math. So 51 A.D. It would be the time when he comes and he meets with the Jewish people in Acts chapter 15. So Acts chapter 15 takes place around 51 A.D. So you can, you can get all these dates in the Bible and get in your mind an idea of how long it takes between this happening and that happening. 44 A.D. is where we are now. Acts 15, it would be 51 A.D. So that's quite a few years later. And it's amazing that you get all these dates because then we can start to add together the different times that uh, things take place. So the Bible is true. The Bible is historical and archaeologically true. It is a historical document. Not only is it truth because it comes from God, the Holy Spirit speaking, but also because historically things literally happen. So why do I give you these numbers and dates? Why do I add this up? Well, you go to secular history and guess what it says? It says, King Herod died in about 44 A.D., according to historical records. And when you look at this, you find out, oh, well, yeah, that jives. That matches. That matches 44. We're here we are now in Acts chapter 12. That's about 44 or 45 A.D. So, where does Herod die? He dies at the end of this book, Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, and look at verse 21, and upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not glory, uh, God the glory. And he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. Now, there's a guy named Josephus that lived during this time, and he writes all about this, and he tells how Herod's death took place, and how he died from being eaten up by worms. Exactly like the Bible says. So out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. You see, the Bible is true. It's a historically accurate book. And you go back and you look at the historical uh, writings of others, you see, hey, it matches. It matches. Why do they then take out the Bible out of schools? You go to a secular college, the first thing they do is make fun of the Bible. But the Bible's a historical book. It's true. And as we study the Bible, we look at dates, and we look at things, we say, you know, this, this all matches. This all matches. So, in, uh, well, I have a lot more dates that I could go into there, but we'll go into that probably in another class. But I just want you to know that it's amazing how you can look at the dates in the Bible. And, and some people have asked me, Brother Breaker, I want your Bible, because your Bible on every page has a date of, of what's taking place. Well, I wish you could get it. My Bible was made by World Publishers in Iowa Falls, uh, and they're out of business. So, uh, some... I think Schofield, I'm not sure, I haven't really used a Schofield Bible. Schofield might also have the um, dates. And it's nice for, for reference to have the dates right there on each page of what's taking place. So this is taking place around 44 A.D. And historically, that's when this guy Herod dies. So just like the Bible says is what Josephus and others say. Now, we get to verse 4. Verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him, to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, there are people out there that hate the King James Bible. And they will tell you the King James Bible is a horrible translation. That's a lie from the pits of hell. The best translation of the Bible is the King James Bible. But this will be the first thing that they'll tell you. The King James Bible is a lousy translation because it translates Easter. And it shouldn't be Easter. And that's what they'll tell you. And if you don't know your Bible, and if you don't know Greek, 
then you can't combat that. And you have to say, well, I guess you're right because you said so. But if you actually know something, I went to Bible school, I learned Hebrew, I learned Greek, and I actually read the Bible. I believe the King James Bible is it. I believe it is the infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. I believe that every word of the King James Bible is what God wants us to have. So I believe that Easter is the correct translation. Now they say, well, no, no, it can't be because the word here in Greek is Pasqua. Okay? Pasqua. Well, that sounds... Pasqua. Well, that sounds a lot like... We would say Pasqua. That sounds a lot like Passover. In fact, Pasqua, La Pasqua, in Spanish is the word for Passover. And so they say what it should be here is it should say... Passover. Oh, should it? Now, when you're translating the Bible, there's a law of translation called the law of context. You must translate the words as closely as possible. I believe in a, a literal, not a dynamic equivalence, but a literal equivalence of translating verbatim as much as possible. But I also believe in the context. Look at verse 3. And because they saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So, you have the author of this book, Acts, which would be who? Luke, writing the book of Acts. And he says, while all this is taking place, it was during the days, plural, S on the end, of unleavened bread. So, there is a feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened bread is a feast. It's a feast that comes after Passover. The Passover comes first on the 14th day of the month. Then the 15th day of the month, seven days, so you've got a seven-day feast, are the days of unleavened bread. So Passover starts on the 14th, and the 15th starts the days of unleavened bread. Well, verse 3 says they were in the days of unleavened bread. So the Passover must have passed. All right? Look at what it says there. So what did Herod do? He, he apprehended him, verse 4, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So Herod was intending till after a certain day to bring him out. All right, if they were already in the days of unleavened bread, how could you translate that as, as Passover? You would have to wait another year for him to bring him out into the people. Was Herod putting him in jail for an entire year so that he could then wait till the next year on Passover to bring him out? No, so I believe the King James translators translated this correctly. They saw the context, and they said, now it's talking about a man named Herod. Herod was a Jew hater. He hated the Jews. He did whatever he did and could do that was necessary to appease them so that they would not riot in the streets like killing James. But he didn't believe in God or the Bible. He didn't believe in, in the law. This guy was a pagan. So what this guy did, this fellow Herod, he celebrated Easter, or the festival of Ishtar. It was the worship of Ishtardi. That's where the word Easter comes from, Ishtar or Ishtardi. It's a pagan festival. So the King James translators looked at this and they said, we can't translate Pasqua into Passover, because if we did, then the Bible has an error and a mistake in it. And there's no errors or mistakes. So obviously when this was translated into Greek, he used the word Pasqua in the Greek, but that also must have meant in the Greek all of this or something, but it won't work in English if we translate Passover. Because then he would have had to wait a whole year because it was in these days here. It was during these days. Now I'm not going to read to you this, but I will give you the references. Leviticus 23, verses 5 through 6. Numbers 9-11. And Numbers 28, 17 tells us clearly in the Old Testament law that the Passover started on the 14th and that the days of unleavened bread begin the day after the Passover on the 15th. So 16, 17, well, I guess you count the 15th. So 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So to the 21st. So the 15th to the 21st are the days of unleavened bread. And the Bible can't have an error or a mistake. So it must be that in context, Herod was waiting till Easter was over. He was going to go celebrate his pagan feast, and when his pagan feast was over, then he would go back to the Jews, and then he would deliver them up and kill Peter. Now people say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you know what? Every other version on the market, besides the King James Bible, 
says Passover. And by so doing, they've perverted the word of God. Because they were already in the days of unleavened bread. Passover has passed. So Herod is going to wait until Passover to, to, to kill Peter. He was going to wait a whole year? Does that make... The only way that that's not a mistake is to follow the King James Bible. And Easter is correct. And you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you can believe whatever you want. I believe that God gave us the King James Bible, and he did it correctly. So I believe it's a correct translation, Easter. If you don't believe that, then help yourself. It's up to you to, to decide what you believe. But I believe that Easter is the right translation and is not an error. I believe it's talking about Herod and the festival that he would have Celebrated, and I believe that that's what some people call an advanced revelation in the King James Bible. I believe this is an advanced revelation in the King James Bible. So the days of unleavened bread come after Passover. Let me give you another example. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar is looking in at Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And he says, there's three men in the fire, but then he says, but there's a fourth man in the fire. Now in the Hebrew... It says, the fourth man was likened to, and you could translate from Hebrew, the son of the gods. Because the word is plural in Hebrew. But that is not what Nebuchadnezzar said. Nebuchadnezzar says, and I saw the fourth man likened to the son of God. All new versions of the Bible translate from Hebrew into English, this, this pagan king saying, I saw the son of the gods. But the context is, these three men standing up against this king saying, you have false gods, we have the true God. And our true God will protect us. And so when Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he sees four men instead of three, he says, that fourth man is the true God that they spoke about. That is the Son of God. And that is the correct translation, and the King James got it right. The King James Bible says, the Son of God. And all other versions are perversions of the Scriptures when they translate the Son of the Gods. That's another example where the context mandates how it's translated. So the King James Bible is so far superior to anything else. Even more superior than the original autographs, if you will, the Hebrew or the Greek. Because the Hebrew or the Greek makes it hard to understand, but English makes it easier. So I thank God for the King James Bible. I do not believe that the word Easter is a mistake in the King James Bible. I believe that's the translation that is correct and by looking at the passage itself, it couldn't have been talking about Passover because it had already passed. They were already in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So I believe the King James is right. What does it matter? You know, it's not an uh, issue of salvation. It's just someone says, well, I prefer this better. Okay, whatever. But you know what? When you go to the new versions of the Bible, other than the King James, it is an issue of salvation. Do you know how many times new versions of the Bible change or take out verses that do deal with salvation. This is not a salvation issue. This verse here, where it translates Easter. But you go to a new version of the Bible, they take out Acts uh, 8.37. That's a doctrinal thing. Uh, they take out other, they pervert other uh, verses. You know, uh, They say you can grow unto salvation. No, you don't. You don't suddenly grow into being saved. You either get saved or you don't. I believe that's uh, 1 Peter 2.2. 2 that you may grow thereby. New versions of the Bible say that you may grow thereby unto salvation. So there are verses in the Bible affected by translation. And it's not the King James. The King James is not translating incorrectly verses so that a person will have a false understanding of salvation. It's the new versions of the Bible that translate incorrectly in key passages that deal with the deity of Christ and salvation. So stick with the King James Bible and you'll never go wrong. Well, I probably made some enemies there, but that's fine. King James is right. When you get to heaven, God's going to tell you. I wanted that translated as Easter because that was the context. And so if you want to argue, argue with God when you get to heaven if you don't like the translation of Easter here in verse 4. Now verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So verse 5 is telling us that while he was put in prison, illegally, I might add, because of mob rule, because the guy in charge was afraid of the mob, he put this guy in jail that hasn't done anything. All the church came together and began to pray for him. Verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So Peter is sitting in the prison, and he's chained on either side 
by a soldier. Now, don't you think that stinks? So these soldiers hadn't done anything, but now they're in jail too. They probably didn't want to be there. So perverting of judgment affects the lives of innocent people. These two poor innocent soldiers, and we're going to find out here in a minute, they were killed, these soldiers, and they didn't do anything. It's so sad when a government abuses its power and murders the innocent. But that's what happens. So they're praying for Peter. Peter's locked up. Let's continue here in verse uh, 6, or verse 7. We just read verse 6. Verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Rise up quickly, and his chains fell from off his hands. So it tells us where he was chained. He's chained on his hands, so probably here on his wrist. Now people say, well, that's a wrong translation. The Bible says uh, hands, but you don't ever chain somebody in the hand. You chain them in the wrist. Well, in the Bible, the hand includes the wrist. Jesus Christ was nailed in his hands. If you nail a person right here and you hang them on a cross, their body weight will rip out because there's nothing there to hold it. So Jesus must have had a nail in his wrist. And in the Bible, a wrist is a part of the hand. People say, there's mistranslations in the King James Bible. No, you're a mistranslation. You don't read the text. You can't read the Bible without seeing all the time they're talking about a hand. It says they put a bracelet on her hand. Where does the bracelet go? On your wrist. So obviously, if you're wearing a bracelet on your hand, the wrist is part of your hand. There's so many people out there that hate the Bible, and they think, I can do a better translation than that. Well, help yourself. But I do not want to stand in judgment of the Bible. I read the Bible, and I believe the Bible, and I go by what it says, and I believe the King James Bible is God's Word, and God's Word says that the wrist is part of your hand. So he had chains on his hand. And so the angel of the Lord came and uh, smote him on the side, Rise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Okay, the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. Almost sounds like put on the whole armor of God, you know. But he says, Now follow me. So he's laying there, probably asleep. He had his shoes off, probably took off his, his coat or whatever. And the Lord's telling him, Now get dressed and follow me. All right, now verse 9. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. This must have been at really late at night, you know, probably 3, 4 in the morning. And uh, he must have been sawing logs, and he does what he's told, and he's sitting there thinking, is this a dream? You ever do that? You ever get up late at night, and you do things, and you're still like, am I really doing this, or am I still asleep just dreaming doing this? Sometimes that happens. Now verse 9. And he went out and followed him, and was not that it was true, which is done by the angel, but thought it was a vision. He saw a vision. Now verse 10. When they were past, the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. So he went out to the second ward. So he comes out of his original gate of whatever prison cell he was in, passed in one ward, then a second ward, and then the jail prison. So four different gates, it looks like, at least. The angel of the Lord let him out. So how did that work out for this secular guy named Herod? Not too well. The secular authority said, we're going to put this guy in jail. And God says, no, you're not. And he got out. Now verse 11 says, And when Peter was come up to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. So God delivered him from the secular authority who was not following the law. He was giving in to mob rule, and God saved him from the people of the Jews, from the, all the non-believing Jews, the religious mob. So God saved him from those people. Now what happens, verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many other gathered together praying. Now this guy's name is Mark or John. We would call him John Mark. So this is a new guy, John Mark. Now John Mark is mentioned a lot more, and he, he goes by the name of Mark. Now once or twice he's called John, but more he goes by the name of Mark. Many people think this is who wrote the, the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, and it could very well be. But this guy Mark hooks up with Paul and Barnabas. So we see 
this guy, Mark. Mark gets together with Paul and Barnabas and goes on a missionary journey with them in the next chapter. But what else does he do? He ends up leaving. And because of that, there's some bitterness and some strife between Barnabas and Paul, and they separate. But at the end of his ministry, Paul says, uh, Now, Mark, I want Mark to come back. So Paul forgives Mark. Let me show you quickly this. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Acts 15, 36. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brother in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, verse 39, that they departed asunder one from another, or from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So you have here the first church split, I guess you will. I don't know if that's what people have tried to call it. You have here Paul saying, this guy John Mark, I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't want him to go with me. I don't want to have anything to do with him. I don't think he loves the Lord. I don't something wrong with him. Paul and Barnabas took a, a journey in chapter 13, and John Mark went with them, but John Mark left. And Paul says, you don't leave like that. And so Paul says, I want nothing more to do with this kid. Well, before he dies... 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, look at this. Look what Paul says before he dies. 2 Timothy 4, 11. Only Luke is with me. Luke is the author of the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also the author of Acts. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So at the end of his ministry, Paul says, you know that Mark guy? And I misjudged him. He's all right. Bring him, and uh, I want to work with him again. So that's interesting. So we can see him mentioned here. And where did he start out? He started out in the church in Jerusalem in a prayer meeting. Now where are we? We're um, verse 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So this would be a church uh, meeting in a house. In the Bible, they always met in homes. And they were having a prayer meeting for who? For Peter. They were praying for Peter. Verse 13, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So she's like, guys, guys, we're praying that God will help Peter. He's right there at the door. He answered our prayer. What did the people praying do? <laughs> Verse 15, and they said unto her, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. <laughs> angel is used here for ghost. It is his, his spirit or so. I mean, he's, he's appearing in his, in his soul. <laughs> he's dead because we know that they were going to kill him. Now that, that's another thing to show you that it wasn't going to wait a whole year that he had planned on a certain day, probably the day of Easter, which is very close to the Passover, to kill him. And they just couldn't believe it. They just could not believe that Peter was free. They knew it took four gates to get in and out. How could he get out of that? Now verse 16, but Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to, to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to, to another place. Now, Look who he says, show these things unto James. Not this James, not the James that was killed at the beginning of the chapter. There is another James. This other James is James, the Lord's brother. So there are two James here. There were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. This was the John, James that was killed, Peter, James, and John. That James was killed. When he died... It looks like the early church said, well, we want this other guy named James, who would have been the half-brother of Jesus, to be the head of the church. And in Acts chapter 15, and I won't go there for sake of time, it looks like he is the one who is the head of the church, who is the first pastor. Uh, well, not the first, I guess he'd be the second. But he is the one in charge of the meeting of Acts chapter 15. So there's two James. So he says, uh, show these things unto James, the other James, the Lord's brother. And to the brother, and he departed and went into another place. Now, verse 18. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what had was become of Peter. Yeah, you think? 
me sitting here in the middle of two guys chained to them with at least four locked gates. And all the soldiers wake up in the morning, they're like, where is he and how come all the gates are open? I wonder how many other prisoners left. Probably none. But here we read, and we continue here in verse 19. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. So what happens? The men that were in charge of watching Peter, they blew it. They didn't do their job. Peter got out. And so the secular government, Herod, held them accountable and said, you got to die. And he killed them. How sad. They didn't do anything wrong. They couldn't have fought against the angel of the Lord. There's nothing they could have done. But they were killed. When a government is in charge and becomes out of control and becomes bloodthirsty, while well, they don't rest until they have blood, till they taste blood. So these poor innocent soldiers were killed because of an evil person, Herod, who wanted to kill somebody just so it would please the mob. Mob rule is so evil, so evil. Well, let me show you another example of this. They say, let's go to Acts chapter 16, they say that the custom in those days, or the law, was that if you were in charge of a prison, and someone escaped from the prison, then you, the head of the prison, had to die. Your life for the life of someone else. So if you would have been the head of a prison, you would never want to see someone escape. You would do everything you possibly could to keep someone from escaping, otherwise it was your neck. Like, you know, four different gates. <laughs> But in Acts chapter 16, we see the same thing when Paul is put in prison. Acts chapter 16, verse 24. We'll read down to verse 31. Well, let's read in verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Verse 24, they're in jail in stocks. Now verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that there, the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. All right, so here's another example. Here's the guy that's in charge, and he says, look, if these prisoners are gone, they're going to kill me. Because that was the law in those days. If people escaped, then you that were supposed to be in charge of them, you died. So it wasn't uh, a game. It was, don't ever let them escape. But not only were... Paul and his companion in their chains taken away, but everyone in the entire jail, their chains were just popped off. And not one of them got up and walked away. And all the doors were open. They just sat there and went, this is odd. And Paul's told them, look, let's, let's don't leave. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved comma, and thy house, insinuating that their house as well, all that the people in his house should do the same, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's an example. So if you were a guy in charge of a prison back then, that's not a job that I would want, because if someone did escape, you got, you got it in the neck for them escaping. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 12, and we got all the way down here to verse 19. And he went down from Judah to Caesarea, and there abode. Verse 20, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but he came with one accord to them, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. So, here we have some peace being made. Now, you can go to history and study history. There was a king named King Aretas, a Nabataean king who invaded Perea. There was trouble at the border. There was what appeared to uh, be a coming war. And uh, there were some things taking place historically at this time. And they all line up with the Bible, just, just completely. And uh, they made peace. And because of that, well, Herod, I think King Tiberius, if I remember correctly, uh, Emperor Tiberius had died during this time. And so Herod was the one that, that was able to, to get peace. And because of that, the people were so thankful. The people began to worship Herod as a god. And that's what we see next, is the people begin to say to Herod, Herod, you're just amazing. You're just great. We just love you while you're a god. And look what happens. Verse 21, Upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, set upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. An oration is a speech. 
So he went there to speak to the people dressed in his best Sunday best, you know, nicest tie, best suit. And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. They said, this isn't a man, this is a God. Now who would the people be that said that? This is what bothers me. The people in that area were the Jews. Herod was the king of the Jews because he was set there by uh, Rome to, to be the secular leader over the conquered people of Israel, the Jews. So the people there that were screaming that were people that were Jews that only believed in one God. Because they rejected the true God, Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible and the law, light rejected becomes lightning. When you reject truth, God lets you have a reprobate mind. And the Jews who only believed in one God said, hey, this guy Herod's so great, we'll just call him a God. They apostatized. They were apostates. They wanted to believe that. And so they cried out and said, oh, he's so great, he's so great, he's a God. Didn't Jesus say, you, you reject me, but he will come in his own name and you'll, you'll accept him or something like that. Remember that? Well, Herod came in his own name. Herod. And here they are trying to tell Herod, you're a God. You're a God, Herod. You're a God. No, he wasn't. So it says here in verse 22, and the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of man. Now verse 23 says, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not glory, a God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now gave up the ghost means he died. So the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, smote him with worms. Now there's a guy named Josephus who writes about this. Josephus was a historian, a Jewish historian around this time. He lived during this time. And he writes of this and he tells about how Herod, if I remember right, I'd have to look it up again, I think only five days he lasted and then he died. And when he died, there were just all these worms inside of him. There's, today there's all these different theories of what he had. Some people think it was maggots. And so the worms were the maggots. Others think it was something else that he had. I just believe what the Bible says. It was worms. There was some sort of worm literally eating him from the inside out. And he died within five days. I have a note here. My Bible says two weeks. But I think other sources I read, it was within five days. It was fast enough to where people would say, man, that was, that was really quick. And it was on their mind. That's the guy we said was a god. And look, he's dead. Now, I, I could have read you Josephus, but... I, you look it up. You can look it up. I was going to thinking about reading what Josephus said about that, but you can look it up. So he died, just like the Bible says. Well, how do you like that? Here is the king of the Jews, a secular king, who will not follow the law. He's arresting innocent people, killing innocent soldiers, and he's going around thinking that he's so great, trying to stop those that are preaching what God said to preach. And what does God do? He says, he ain't nothing. And he allows people to call him God. Now, if he, if he would have said, whoa, I'm not God, I don't think the Lord would have smote him. But he kind of sat there and he kind of went, yeah, I kind of like that. Maybe I am a God. And God in heaven said, no, you ain't. Boop. And he was smote and he was dead. So he lasted anywhere between five days to two weeks, eaten up completely of worms, and he died. Some God, some God he was, but verse 24 says, But the word of God grew and multiplied. So this whole chapter is about how Herod and the secular government and Rome, the Roman Empire, you know, the, the, the biggest, greatest empire in the entire world that had the greatest uh, 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 empire ever, with the possible exception of you know England, Britannia rules the waves and the sun never sets on the British Empire, with the exception of England, the greatest, most biggest, most powerful kingdom in the world, and this guy was put as the king of the Jews, and God killed him because he thought he was a god. And the word of God multiplied even though he tried to squelch it out and to stop the preaching of the truth by killing those that were preaching it, James and Peter. Now verse 25, and here's Saul, or Paul. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So here's Mark mentioned again. So here's Mark, here's Paul. And Paul's name is really Saul. We're going to find out in chapter 13, there's a name change. Why Saul changes his name to Paul. And uh, does God change his name or is his name changed? It could have been that it's both of his names. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that next time. So this is Acts chapter 12. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Not much to it. A lot of history to it. But also uh, a lot of important history.
things there. And it shows you that God is more powerful than any secular government. Now, yes, secular governments can have victories. They killed James. But God can also stand up on the behalf of believers against a secular government and do miracles. And sometimes he does. So, you, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm going to fight the world government. Or I'm going to fight the secular government. And I'm going to win. There's no guarantee. It just all depends on if God wants you to or not. And so you might, you might not, but pick your fights, choose your fights. Don't even fight the secular government. Just, just occupy yourself in serving the Lord and winning souls. That's the most important thing. And not getting in fights with the secular government because they're not important. What's important is winning souls to Jesus Christ. I don't want to be someone who's a, uh, what do you call those people that are anti-government. I don't want to be that. I don't want to devote my time and my energy to going against the government. Although, you know, they are corrupt. It's never wrong to point out corruption. <laughs> but the most important thing is winning people to Jesus. And if you're going to suffer from a secular government, make sure you're suffering for preaching the gospel. That should be the most important thing. Well, there it is. There's Acts chapter 12. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. God bless.